1968, a year of trauma. America was at war in Vietnam and on our own streets. Boston, like many American cities, was in crisis, broke and declining in every way, in every corner, smoldering with old hatreds and new problems like rising crime and deepening despair. 25% of the city's population had simply surrendered and moved out. So I want to first read the statement and then... Uh... This was the city Kevin Hagen White was elected to lead. Under my administration, it'll be on the needs of people in the neighborhoods. He had been in elected politics just seven years. Perhaps he was born to politics. And like any older son of a father, you understand, you sense, you learn. And I began to sense and learn. But this certainly wasn't politics as usual. This was different. A sense of unity is desperately needed in this city. Many of the experts, academics, and even politicians had given up on the American city. But Kevin White did not give up. I think that the American city is really at the beginning of a, a, a period of renaissance. He really didn't have a choice. In the late 1960s, in almost every way, Boston was a dying city. But that reality seemed to bring him to life. Here's what I'd like you to do. It triggered his imagination and his fighting spirit. I can fight back. I can pay back, I suppose, and there's a little of the Irish in us. He brought people with energy, ideas, and ideals to city government. Many of them had never worked in government before. He brought real diversity to city departments for the first time in Boston's history. He inspired people with a sense of what's possible. He demanded that people rethink what a city is and what a city could be. And together, they demanded the best from each other to create a new Boston, the next Boston. He had a feeling for people and he did what had to be done for them in the streets they called home. He took on challenges that just kept coming, busing, Proposition Two and a Half. Through all of it, he knew which hands to hold and which arms to twist. People have got to stand up and fight for things that mean something to them. Sometimes he did it with the people's support. <laughs> Let me tell you, you running for something? <laughs> For three years of law school, I was a toll taker on the Mystic River were, Bridge. And I'm a Boston College Law School right now, and I read that you were a toll taker at the bridge, right? I was at 12 at night till 8 in the morning, and you would be in law school? DC Law. We did the same. Maybe you can All run right. for mayor. Good luck. And sometimes he did it in spite of their opposition. That's called leading. Hello, WMEX. Hello. Hello, Mayor Block. Are you there, Mayor Block? I am. Uh, why didn't your car do something for the white people? For the rich people? For the white people. Well, I am. Quite often, he did it alone. He was that loner in love with the city. The development of the Charlestown Navy Yard, Easty, Southie, Dorchester across the bay. Jobs and investment and people are coming back into this city. The opportunities are incredible in the 80s. And so are the challenges. There's a job to be done. I like that job. Tell you the truth. I love it. His singular vision, like a sentry's, watching the city come back, block by block, brick by brick. That's called progress. He flirted with national politics, and national politics flirted with him. But he stayed and stuck with the job. He was the mayor. Kevin White once said that each of us is the architect of our own destiny. Well, today, look around, look at the skyline, look at Boston, and you realize Kevin White has been the architect of destiny for all who live here and the city we love, all who will come to live here in the decades ahead.
As long as I'm mayor, nobody will own Boston. Because I'll tell you something. Nobody owns Kevin White.